Good afternoon, and welcome to the No BS Debates with the last two City Council candidates from District 9. I am your moderator, Jonathan De La Vaca, and I want to thank both of our candidates for coming out to represent their communities and what some have seen as unexpected and some have seen as inevitable uh, in terms of outcome, a runoff uh, for City Council uh, District 9. We have our incumbent, Albus Brooks, and Candy Sitabaka. Albus raised an impressive $274,452, and Candy raised $95,902, according to cleanslatenowaction.org. Albus is a two-term, if I'm correct, two-term city councilman vying for his third seat. Uh, he received 44.75% of the vote, compared to Candy's 43.06% of the vote in the May election. Uh, that's a difference of only 286 votes. Uh, this is Candy's first run for office. Yes, it is. We want to thank our hosts, the Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, Civic Matters, and Yellow Scene Magazine for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank all of you, including our in-house audience, uh, for participating for the second time in the democratic process. Your votes will decide this runoff election. Please remember to vote by June the 4th. The debate rules are as follows. After the candidates' 1.5 minute introductions, we will begin our debate. I will ask a candidate a question, and they will have two minutes uh, to answer, followed by five minutes of open debate back and forth uh, between yourselves. Uh, I will chime in as necessary. Uh, we encourage robust and lively debate, but will interrupt if uh, either party is going too long. We want to keep this on track. The debate is slated for 50 minutes, uh, and as we draw into the last five minutes, we will stop to move into closing statements. Uh, Denver City Council District 9 is located in central Denver uh, and serves the diverse neighborhoods of Aurora, Central Business District, City Park, City Park West, Clayton, Cole, Illyria Swansea, Five Points, Globeville, Skyland, Union Station, and Whittier. I just love that they're all alphab alphabetical. Let's move into our opening statements. We'll begin with uh, Candidate Brooks. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, and I want to thank uh, open Media and everyone for putting on this debate. My name is Albus Brooks and I've had the privilege and opportunity to serve in this community for 20 plus years um, as a nonprofit leader with kids of color, as a community leader, but most importantly as a father um, and a husband. Uh, father to Makai, Kenya and Kaya and a husband to Debbie. It's through my family's eyes that I have a vision uh, for this city and I want to talk to you about this vision tonight. Um, and it, 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 it's about how do we come together and be, have an inclusive community, an inclusive Denver. And I believe we do that in three ways. One, it's housing for all. Uh, two, we want to make sure that we put together a free transit system. And thirdly, investing in our future, our young people. That is what I'm about. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And tonight, what I want you to hear is a leader who has uh, put a vision out there but has also implemented it and has a vision for the future. Thank you. Mr. DeBaca. Good afternoon. My name is Candy Sedebaca. I am a fifth generation native of District 9, a social worker, a community organizer, and a policy expert. I've consistently led with solutions and built broad coalitions to solve our city's greatest challenges. Um, I'm running because I believe that Denver is at a turning point. Um, we've had a lot of growth that hasn't necessarily benefited all people in Denver. And so I'm running because I think we need to grow more responsibly. We need to build people-centered transportation solutions. And we, most importantly, we need to build a government that's accountable to its people. On May 7th, a majority of our district voted for a change. And I took home a great share of those votes. And I believe I'm positioned best to take over and be that change that our voters are demanding in District 9. And so I hope to earn your vote um, by June 4th. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let Denver vote. Uh, Denver will be voting on Initiative 302, the Let Denver Vote Initiative, which was added to the runoff ballot. Uh, the initiative states the city and county of Denver may not appropriate, uh, appropriate, expend, guarantee, or otherwise use directly or indirectly any public monies or resources for the purpose of bidding for, aiding, or furthering an Olympic game or any event thereof without seeking and receiving prior voter, uh, voter approval. 
Uh, a 302 proponent says the city won't share how much they spent in chasing the 2026 Winter Games bid. Utah claimed that they could host it cheaper than uh, other candidates at $1.35 billion. The cost of planning, hiring consultants, organizing events, and the necessary travel consistently falls between 50 and 100 million. Tokyo spent as much as 150 million on its failed 2016 bid. Organizers say that it's important to note that they are neutral on actually <coughs> hosting the games, but want voters to have a voice. Do you support 302? If not, or if so, how does Denver become a global city, which includes hosting global events while respecting the rights of citizens and creating inclusive and long-lasting development that doesn't add to the gentrification and displacement? We'll begin with Candy. So I absolutely support um, Let Denver Vote. Uh, while I was not an original signatory on that ballot initiative, I was one of the original members of community that conceived of this ballot initiative. In response to what is happening in our district, uh, specifically with the National Western Redevelopment, what we discovered when we were filing multiple lawsuits regarding the I-70 expansion through our community was that there was an underlying motive and that was the Olympic bid. And when that was exposed, um, it became very clear that there were, was an effort in our city to bring the Olympics without the voters' input, without community's input. And so I absolutely have um, followed the logic of form follows function throughout my career and uh, my personal growth. And I think that if Denver wants to become a global city, um, Denver should do right by its residents and create a livable city that will attract the attention of people globally. And so I don't think it's something that we should be chasing um, and turning our city into a tourist attraction before serving our residents. So I believe residents should shape the city and if we shape a high quality city then eyes will be turned on us globally thanks for the question i uh will be supporting uh, the initiative as well i, I you know i 100 percent support uh, making sure if we're going to do events that is privately funded um, that we do not use our public resources uh, for events like that um, and i was actually a part of uh, the committee um, to look at should we bring the Olympics, should we go after the Olympics to the city of Denver? And here are the things that I said. Number one, um, we don't want the Olympics unless there's a legacy project. If you look at all the other Olympic games, there have not been legacy projects and it has cost the city millions, if not billions of dollars and put them in financial ruin. One of the legacy projects could be a central village where we could have that be affordable housing for the future. And so um, that's something that I'm uh, excited about if there was an opportunity for that. The committee that we put on, and I hope this is made public uh, and folks know this, no one wanted to use any public dollars uh, if we go after the, the Olympics. We want to use all private dollars. And so uh, I want to let that be known. And the other thing, uh, uh, Candy Sidbaka just said that there was an effort with the National Western uh, beforehand. You know, if you're going to make those kind of claims, which is false, uh, make sure you have vi uh, verifiable evidence. We, there's no evidence that we were trying to recruit uh, the Olympics beforehand. That was a Kyle Zeppelin-led uh, uh, Facebook propaganda. So we, we just need facts if we're going to talk about this for the city. There actually are facts, and we have been saying um, for 10 years that we've found through emails that were Cora'd yeah. that there were talks about the Olympics. And one of the things that was uh, an indicator of the plans for National Western was in the master plan, there was an Olympic ice rink um, that was built into that without any request mm. from the community for that. Uh, then when we started Cora'ing uh, the city of Denver, for emails that would have revealed those intentions. Um, the Nation magazine exposed the exploratory committee and then the following day, Denver announced that there they, were pull, they had just pulled together an exploratory committee. So just to respond, uh, there's, there's no ice rink. Um, I'm a part of the National uh, Western Citizens Advisory Committee, which Candy used to be a part of, but she has pulled away from that, is no longer a part of that. We just work with the community men members and take their suggestions on what should be developed at the National Western Center. I would ask you to expose all of those emails um, because we have no record of any of that. 
The article that you mentioned, the uh, the Nation, is that the one redlining returns to Denver but with a neoliberal twist? Yes. I called this project the last great surge in highway-based urban renewal projects. Yes. Uh, Mr. Brooks, you said that you were on the committee to bring the Olympics. Yeah. Were there any public dollars used in the initial uh, bid process? No, we didn't use public dollars. None at all. Part of the problem with the way they're classifying usage of public dollars is that we have put, uh, there are requirements, prerequisites for venues, for um, interstate infrastructure. And so what they've done since the 70s, since our city turned down the Olympics the first time, is they've been lining up the prerequisites, uh, paying for them, getting them completed, so that when they make the bid, all of the venues are already constructed and had been constructed with public dollars, but they can get away with saying that no new dollars will be go into, will go into um, these bids. Moving into the next question, I was told uh, by a proponent of 302 who uh, brought a lot of this information to me that there was gonna be a fundraiser for Mayor Hancock uh, in the next week that's hosted by a lot of developers that were specifically involved in uh, the Olympic bid. Um, in terms of development, and transportation, right? Uh, increasingly, the city is focused uh, on high-end development, uh, which has forced people out of their neighborhood due to increased cost. Uh, increasingly, people who work in the city can't afford to live here. Uh, it was reported that 88% of new apartments were luxury, uh, mm -hmm. which is an interesting earmark for, uh, for Denver, the cow town. It's been called a cow town. Uh, I think the majority of folks here can't afford luxury apartments. Uh, another major issue in D9 is sale of public assets for private market rate development. It's been common under uh, specifically the Hancock administration recently. Uh, and Mr. Brooks, under your tenure uh, in the area, one example would be the Avalon Bay uh, development in Five Points, which was a city block bought by a private uh, company from the Denver Housing Authority in 2015. Uh, the Westward reported as well that the value of all construction permitted, uh, permitted in, uh, by the department in 2018 was nearly $4.2 billion, which is more than triple the figure from 2011. Uh, how will you work from your seat on council to affect city planning that better addresses the inequity of housing in Denver and reins in the uh, rampant development that isn't serving the needs of, of the citizens that are actually here now? So um, thank you for that. I think um, when I took office in 2011, a census report uh, came in that 80205, the district I represent, was one of the top gentrifying zip codes uh, in the country. That was 2010. Since 2011, we have rampantly been building um, affordable housing units from homeless housing all the way up to workforce housing, over 2,000 units in my tenure and 5,402 um, in, in District 9 right now. And so what that shows us is that's the highest in any amount of the city. We are working together, we're working with the administration, we're working with uh, developers to make sure that we get that done. Now, the next thing we need to do is start working with our public assets, right? DPS, making sure we're working with RTD, and also making sure uh, that we're working with folks like the Denver Housing Authority to, to ensure that these, um, this land, it stays deeded for 99 years and we, we put affordable housing on it. I've done it, we've done it on Welton, we'll continue to do it all over the city. Um, I think the root of what you're bringing up is selling off publicly owned assets for market rate development and I think there needs to uh, be a moratorium on doing that. I think right now when we talk about, and I've busted this myth in past debates with Councilman Brooks, um, it's not unique or special that we have the most public housing or low income or affordable housing in our district. That has been um, the, the context since 50 years ago. That's where we concentrated low income housing. It's the urban core. That's where it should be concentrated. And so selling off parcels in the urban core because they're now suddenly more valuable and leveraging those dollars to build housing um, in the outskirts as far as Green Valley Ranch is not appropriate. We're removing people from areas that we develop specifically for them. Um, when we talk about transit, transit oriented development, when we've concentrated our resources. And so one, we absolutely have to stop selling off publicly owned land. Um, and I would make sure of that on council. So I don't know where Green Valley Ranch came into this. Green Valley Ranch is one of the lowest 
um, uh, districts in the entire city for putting together affordable housing. Um, and we have never seen this much affordable housing in, in a four-year tenure in the last 20 years. And so um, I think that points directly to leadership. I think that points directly to my vision and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and let's talk about the selling off of public lands because we have a criteria in the city of Denver that we go over. Unfortunately, we don't own Denver Housing Authority. And what happened there was a travesty. I will tell you, we will get all of the, the units from the lands that they land that they did sell because of the hope six grant they have to build those units out um, but to see properties flip like that i can understand why the community is upset but on on our watch in the city of denver um, let's talk about land that we have had and land that we have used for affordable housing because i think that's an important conversation and what we can do in the future to make sure that we use that land for the folks of the city just to uh, add it to the conversation, one of our uh, audience members asked about dark money and local politics. And dark money is often uh, invoked when it comes to development. Uh, so what is your plan? Do you have an idea of what dark money is doing? Is money influencing politicians that are voting in different directions? Uh, what, what's the concern and how do we address it? So let's, let's define what dark money is um, in politics. Um, what I love about our system is that we let you know everybody who's given to our campaign. Um, what we found in this campaign is actually, Candy has a number of organizations that are working um, on her behalf, Colorado People's Alliance, things like that, that do not have to, um, they're supposed to talk about all the money that they put in, that's dark money. If we cannot see who your donors are, that is dark money. So I wanna be very clear about that. Um, and we're seeing that in this campaign, and it's, it's, it's a travesty. And, and, and Candy was one of the people who were proponents of 2E and making sure that we had lower limits and, and, and transparency and greater transparency, but we can't see who's giving to these campaigns that are helping her campaign. That's, that's not accurate. Um, and dark money is when you cannot trace dollars to an individual, um, but just because you have PAC money doesn't mean that it's not traceable. And so for the people who are working on my behalf, community organizations that have served Denver residents, um, they do report every single one of their donors. And so just because it shows up as Colorado People's Action on my campaign finance reports, doesn't mean that you can't go to their finance reports and trace every single donor who is donating to them in order for them to donate to me. And as, as Councilman Brooks mentioned, uh, I was an original signatory on campaign finance reform in this city. And city council pulled in uh, Democracy for the People and they made changes to allow for PACs and they pushed out the implementation date so that that uh, campaign finance reform initiative wouldn't impact our races. If they had impacted our races, Councilman Brooks would be the only person affected right now uh, because he wouldn't have been able to raise as much money as he has raised. It would be half of what he's raised um, and he wouldn't have been able to have spent that much if he couldn't raise that much. Um, to move on to the next question. Unfortunately, I just gotta say this, unfortunately, that sounds good, but all it does is allow more uh, soft side, independent expenditures, all this dark money to come into our campaigns and that's what's gonna happen in the future. Mark my words. The Office of Economic uh, Development's lack of proper implementation and enforcement of regulations is not ensuring affordability of housing. Yeah. This is from the uh, Denver Auditor, Timothy O'Brien's report that said that the agency is incorrectly calculating sales, uh, not determining eligibility uh, mm -hmm. accurately, so people that could afford higher cost housing have been uh, taking affordable housing units. But let's move into the other side of housing, right, which is the people that are unhoused. Hmm. Uh, the recent Right to Survive initiative failed, uh, meaning the camping ban is still in effect, even while no other solutions to the immediate needs uh, and rights of the unhoused has been proposed. In a 2018 interview with Politics Unplugged, Mr. Brooks said, we need to stay focused on delivering services to homeless individuals and not work on a bill to take away park curfews and saturate our rivers and saturate the public right of way. We need to get people into housing. Uh, and I think we can all agree on that. Uh, Lisa Calderon pointed out that Denver has one of the highest rates of displacement in the nation and that 51% of all renters and 65% of black renters are rent burdened, meaning they are spending more than 30% of their income uh, on rent. Eric Sullivan, the former affordable housing director under Hancock, pointed out that in 2009, Denver's black population was primarily located 
uh, in the northeast of the city, by 2014, there was a dramatic decrease uh, in that concentration. Uh, it, it was also reported uh, in, in Westward that Denver leads the nation in Hispanic displacement due to gentrification. Returning to the auditor, Timothy O'Brien, uh, he said in his scathing critique of affordable housing policies in Denver that under Hancock, agencies like Denver's Road Home, which provides services to people experiencing homelessness, and the environmentally focused Office of Sustainability have both been identified by city auditor reports as lacking the staff or resources they need to fulfill their mission. The, the two departments that have grown uh, the fastest are the departments dedicated to helping the city grow. Uh, without the necessary staff, the audit found, the agency was unable to plan strategically and develop effective policies. With an eye toward mitigating the suffering of the unhoused and preventing more rent-burdened families from dropping into severe poverty or into homelessness themselves, how will you address inequalities uh, and institutional failures in city government? Back to Candy. There is very little transparency and accountability in our city. We <coughs> have a very heavy mayoral control system, and to date we've had a rubber stamp city council. Um, I think that when we talk about how we have failed to address housing, the, the complete spectrum of housing, um, it, it happens because right now you have different parts of the spectrum living in different agencies. You have Denver's Road Home, you have the Office of Economic Development, you have Denver Human Services, and none of those are talking to each other. And so, one, I think we need to consolidate our efforts around housing so we can address the entire spectrum in a holistic fashion. Um, I also think that we need to have an entity exclusively dedicated to compliance and monitoring. When we do put good policies into, into place, we lost 300 homes from our affordable housing portfolio because of a lack of monitoring. In fact, we have a city employee um, who was found to be abusing the affordable housing um, option. He had an affordable housing unit that he was renting for market rate. Once more. Yes, please. Uh, for market rate, for market rate um, rent and was not even let go. He was, we have no idea how this person was held accountable and this is a city employee if we do that, if we don't hold city employees accountable, I mean, we can't expect any kind of transparency or accountability for the agencies as a whole. Even the auditor, I mean, to have that report and to still have no plan of action, is in, it, it blows my mind. Mr. Brooks? Yeah, so uh, city council gave a scathing uh, review of the mayor's uh, office around um, how we take care of these housing, how, how we begin to look at our entire housing portfolio and begin to look at the regulations and making sure that it's very clear and people aren't jumping through the hoops. And so we pushed that a lot. The auditor uh, did his report um, and now, I don't know if you know Candy paid attention to the news, but now the mayor has said we're going to bring all of the agencies around housing together in one office. Uh, in my office. And I think that's what I have, that's what Councilwoman uh, Ortega, Councilwoman Kanich have been calling for for a long time is that we need a reorg and bring all the um, organizations in housing together so that um, everybody can talk to each other. We need the home, homeless housing, we need our workforce housing, all of those IHO together to make sure that we're dealing with these issues. And so I 100% agree that there is an issue. Um, and I believe that we need to look tighter at regulation. Um, unfortunately, uh, what, uh, you know, that, what Zach did in, oh, I'm, I'm losing time, okay. What Zach did in the city council was, was not okay um, at all. Um, and, you know, it's, you know it's, it shows bad to the public who are struggling to get into housing. It's no coincidence, though, that these solutions have come uh, in the election season, the campaign season. You all have had eight years to figure this out, and it's not, it's, it's a, not a surprise that let they're me, barely let coming. Me just, it's let also me important to point yeah. out that uh, the article from the Westward that talked about the growth of the city bureaucracy yeah. pointed out that Mayor Hancock has done an excellent job of creating new departments yeah. uh, without supporting them. Yeah. Uh, that's part of the report. Let me just respond that to that out. real quick and just say that, um, like I said before, when 2016 uh, we passed uh, the first 
affordable housing fund, that was part of our recommendations, is that we align all of uh, the agencies. What Candy will learn on city council, I don't control the agencies. I can't make that call. And finally, um, we believe that the mayor did it, and we believe it's the right move. It's just, we just wish it was earlier. Uh, so do we. In a conversation recently, uh, it was pointed out that redlining in Denver is still in effect. Uh, up until 2019, uh, <coughs> black homeowners and people of color in general are not able to get uh, loans to maintain homes. It adds to uh, displacement, uh, adds to gentrification, adds to uh, poverty, which adds to crime, which brings us to community wellness. Uh, gang violence uh, was at its lowest levels uh, in a generation before Hancock was elected. After the election, uh, 2011, Murders and gang violence began a couple years later to slowly start increasing. By the first quarter of 2013, gang violence and homicides had nearly doubled once again, which peaked in the summer of 2015. The Colorado Sun wrote on a different topic that Colorado considered an abortion law that was more severe than Alabama, defining the start of human life at fertilization and even allowing for the death penalty for doctors who perform an illegal abortion. Uh, Karen Middleton, uh, the executive director of NARL, uh, Pro-Choice Colorado said that we are never as far from these other states as we think we are. It's only one election. Denver and 16 local governments have filed lawsuits uh, in U.S. District Court against the makers and distributors of prescription painkillers over the opiate epidemic. More than 10,000 Colorado residents died from drug overdoses between 2000 and 2015. The suit cites state health department figures that opiate-related overdoses tripled in Colorado during that time. Uh, Mr. Brooks, you were first elected in 2008. How will you work to address these major issues in your district and prevent them uh, from, uh, from worsening? Conversely, uh, what can Denver do, if anything, to address the institutional failings that underlie these issues? Okay, you said a lot there. Yeah. And so I want to just be clear on what we're talking about. I was elected in 2011, number one. But um, are we talking about opioids? Are we talking about gang violence? Are we talking about safety? Violence, safety. It's all community wellness. They all tie together uh, at the end of the day. Okay, so num number one, I, I'll just say that um, in, in eight years in this city, uh, we were one of the fastest growing cities in, in America. And when you see a fast growing city, you usually see a high spike in crime. Today, we're the seventh safest city in America. Um, and so overall, right now, what we're seeing is that we're actually doing pretty good. On the east side, in Clayton and Cole, um, in the Five Points area, we have been struggling around our gang violence, around black, our black and brown boys uh, going at each other, and so, um, and women. And so one of the things that um, we've been looking at is violence interruption uh, in our office. I was the first um, city council office to hire a former felon who was actually a part of the Summer of Violence to lead that effort, and that's what we're doing right now. We're also expanding our My Brother's Keepers program in the city and, and advocating that the mayor make it a seat in his office, um, that that be run out of his office and funded uh, through the general fund. When we talk about opioids, uh, this is near and dear to my heart as someone who has had cancer and someone who has found a reliance on opioids as I was going through my treatments. Um, that's one of the reasons we looked at all of the different uh, access areas to make sure um, that we're dealing with this crisis. So we put out a plan, uh, uh, a five-year plan in the city of Denver, um, and it's going really well. We, we also, also passed legislation around um, a safe injection site, which was very controversial, but we believe um, that it is not safe for people to be in parks, people to be in public, uh, public buildings using. Uh, we need a safe place and we need to save lives and make sure that those individuals um, have an opportunity to live. Candy. Um, when we're talking about uh, health in our city and community wellness, we didn't even make the top 500 list of healthiest cities in the country. And so what that report really um, investigated was those things that you mentioned, the, the structural issues that lead to the gang violence, that lead to the opioid abuse and addiction. Um, and so when we start trying to formulate solutions, we have to address the root causes. And when you see those spikes in violence, when you see um, that increased segregation, that's not a natural part of a city growing. That's 
that comes with inequity and that comes with deep economic divides um, that comes with social exclusion and over policing when you're bringing in communities um, that don't particularly like the people in their community that they're coming into um, you are also there's this huge education piece Our, we don't have control over it as city council but we do have a platform and we should be using our platform to make sure that our, our schools are not as segregated as our communities are. And so I would like to see us really digging deeper into that economic and wealth divide to make sure that we're not creating the tension um, and we're not allowing the tension to fester because of our growth, but that we're creating equity for people. Mr. Brooks. Yeah, so, you know, I thought I just mentioned the My Brother's Keeper program, which has so many, um, it, uh, it allows and opens up for so many opportunities for our, our folks of color who are struggling in this cycle, right? It's an economic opportunity, it's educational opportunity, it's social emotional wellness. Those are, that encompasses all of our, the hot spots in our city, <coughs> Southwest Denver, north, near Northeast Denver, far Northeast Denver, where we're seeing those hot spots and we begin to come around with resources for these individuals. That's exactly why I'm so supportive of connecting our young men and women to the economic opportunities in our community. And they are getting jobs today. We are hiring felons right Right now on North, in Northeast Denver faster than we have ever done it before and they're staying in their job and that's what we have to do and I, I think that's we're seeing some success there. An that audience question, another aspect of community wellness, <coughs> uh, not to cut you off, I apologize, how healthy is the environment in District 9? Has it gotten better or worse in the past decade and how does it compare environmentally uh, to measurements nationally? Well we definitely, we have um, one of uh, the most polluted zip code in America in one of our neighborhoods in District 9. Um, we've had some pushback from Councilman Brooks about that classification, but it has been identified. We have pollution from the Superfund site in our land. We have the air pollution of urban, urban highways in neighborhoods. Um, and we also have the cumulative impact of dirty industry around us and specifically Suncor, which is outside of our county line, but directly impacts the people in our city. <coughs> and so the health of our community when it comes to our environment is, is incredibly disappointing because we have an opportunity right now to build, to, people are coming to our city because of our environment. And we are, I think it's 11th worst air quality in the country. Um, we're at the third hottest heat island because we're overdeveloping and we've gutted our green roofs initiative. So we need to be focusing on saving our planet. We need to be operating as if our planet is on fire. And that is the last priority on city council's agenda. I wish I had my cup, Facts Matters, again, because I want everybody to know that Facts Matters and go and research all of this. Uh, you know, Denver Wright did an excellent article on um, the worst zip codes uh, in Glovo, O'Leary, Swansea, 80216, and it, it's, not, it's not the worst zip, it's not the worst polluted zip code in the country. Um, you can go research that on your own. But more importantly, I'm not disagreeing uh, with, with Candy. Um, racist uh, principals and, and um, leaders just put the worst in Global Area Swansea for years, for a hundred years. But I believe in the last five years, since 2000, uh, actually four years, since 2015, we have been investing in Global Area Swansea and investing in the health, safety, and wellness of that community like never before. So much so that every time a new grant or new investments come, I have members of council upset at me because of what we're getting, connecting sidewalks and things like that, and I have to explain to them it's because of the disinvestment for years. One thing that I wanna note as well, uh, folks have been talking about the brown cloud, um, and we have had that. Um, and, and, and we have to look at that and understand that that is a short-term issue if we look at the long-term issue of DDPHE, CDPHE, all of our state, local, regional councils, we have seen a decrease in particles, um, specific particles in our city over the long term. But our short term, we are experiencing regional issues, like you said, that have come over um, our city. With the lack of leadership, we, 
the community had to fight just to get air monitors into our community to hold DDPHE accountable for making sure that the construction in our community wasn't going to harm our health. With CDPHE, there's no leadership from Denver holding them accountable for enforcing their standards. In fact, CDPHE granted Suncor permits to pollute beyond what they should be allowed to pollute. And there was not a word from city council. So, so let, me let me just say this real quick. Community should, this happened exactly as it should have. Community should advocate. Council should advocate. And DDPHE should change their policy as they did. So this is working. No, the we si elect the DD you. The DDPHE is working for our community. Look at the facts. The facts show that there are particles, particles, particles that are going down. It is actually 20 to 90 percent more cleaner today than it's ever been. We that's know not, that. That's not it's accurate. Factual. In fact. We elect you to represent and us. I'll have and you sit down with Andrew Ross to talk about this. I mean, this is clear. We have sat clear. down with him. This and he is told why me he are, told you. <laughs> this is why there are federal lawsuits. This is why there are okay. state lawsuits about changing the modeling yeah. for pollution. Yeah. Let's move on to the last uh, question, which is not really a question. Uh, this will be an open debate area uh, for you two to address each other, challenge each other. Uh, what are the major areas that set you apart from each other? What should voters be looking at? Uh, what tools are you using to keep your ear to the ground in your communities? Uh, what community organizations do you use in order to keep connected to your district? Uh, these types of things. Uh, and that's five minutes for you. Well, you know what? I want to just uh, get out there and just talk about homelessness. Um, uh, since that seems to be the thing that everybody wants to talk about, I think it was the number one driver in the election, unfortunately that 300 drove everyone to the ballots um, out of fear of it and issues. Um, and it, what, what I struggle with is I don't feel like folks are really getting in to really address the issue on both sides. And so, um, you know, Candy supported an initiative um, that was turned down over 80% 80, 80 overwhelmingly. Um, my focus was not to jump on the initiative. I, you know, the policy was bad, we shouldn't have supported it. The focus should be, let's, to solve real city issues, we gotta put real city money behind it. So right now, $60 million of our housing fund, the most ever in Denver's history, is going towards housing. A third of that is going toward homelessness. That needs to be three times. To do that, we need to pass, um, we need to put some on the ballot if people are really serious about this to support it. The difference in our leadership is I'm talking to the community, I'm seeing what needs to be done, and I'm implementing policy solutions right away. I think what sets us apart is our priorities. I prioritize people. Councilman Brooks prioritizes profit. And so I have consistently worked for the people of our community, and that's evident through the community organizations that I've been associated with. Um, we have what we do is we lead with the solutions and consistently experience pushback from city council whenever we're trying to solve our own problems. Um, we have had to force the hand of our representation to act on our behalf and that's not how this should work. Um, we should be able to go to our representatives and have them act without a fight against community on our behalf. Um, we were the ones who who brought campaign finance reform to the table. We were the ones who proposed alternative solutions, healthier, cheaper solutions to the I-70 expansion. We were the ones who proposed community land trusts um, so that community had an opportunity to build ownership and, and generational wealth in our community. We were the ones who proposed um, grocery cooperatives in our community that were turned down and instead we're still looking to grocery stores who we know have racist uh, policies about how they determine whether or not they come into communities. We are the ones in community who are consistently trying to make the changes. And I think what sets me apart is that I've always taken my cue from community members. Uh, Councilman Brooks, Brooks, I believe, takes his cue from developers and people who have money to pay to play. So the dog whistles in here are just unbelievable because I thought we were talking about homelessness and I thought we were talking about trying to address one of the largest 
issues in the city. That's what I was talking about. And then all of a sudden now it's profit and developers. Um, and so what I'm talking about, and this is, this is exactly, she wants to continue to make up issues and I'm focused on one of the most important issues going on. She wants to talk about developers and she's taking money from developers. That's not, I'm not even interested in that debate. I'm interested in serving my community and when I knock on a door and nine out of 10 people tell me that affordable housing and homelessness are the first thing on their mind, that's what I wanna solve, okay? So those are the things that separate us. What's it's your action mission? steps, I'm, I'm not done. It's action steps and even working with Candy and uh, the Globeville, um, the GES coalition to make sure that we do rezonings um, to allow for affordable housing, we are partnering with them. So you're not yelling at your council person, I'm there, I'm working with you, beside you in that. Candy? What you're missing is that everything I identified, <coughs> your priorities is why you're barely trying to solve problems in your eighth year of leadership. You've had eight years to address homelessness and our housing crisis. Why are you barely focusing on it in your final year? When we talk about solving our homelessness let issue respond to that and question. your prior, I'm not done. Let, let, me, let me respond I'm to that not question. Done. Let, me, let me respond I'm not to done. it. When you were talking about solving the problem of homelessness and your priorities being developers, that is why we have 8,000 people on the street while we have 23 we vacant luxury units. We don't have 8,000 people on the street. Okay, so let me just say this. Uh, since I've been in office, 7,000 people have come off the streets. Um, we worked really hard uh, with the, um, our housing coalition, our homeless coalition, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, all of these individuals have worked together, a thousand people per year coming off the street. So I didn't just drop in and do this. I'm saying, how do we go now? How do we take it to the next level and making sure we're doing a citywide and regional um, aspect? This is stuff that we've been working on for a long time. And you know that. Here's a, a weird fact. Uh, the city of Denver now spends nearly a billion dollars uh, annually on salaries alone. Uh, the only other area of Colorado spending a billion dollars on anything is our uh, corrections department, uh, mostly on the backs of drug offenses. Um, is that a weird correlation? 70% of our general fund automatically goes to, to staff. And it, it does seem like a real correlation now, but if you went back, if you were with me in 2011 and you walked through the Wellington Web building, which is all of our administration, it, it's half empty. The city of San we Diego is comparable to us and spends uh, $780 million instead it's of It's not apples to apples. Different type, of, different type of issues, right? When you walk into the city, we weren't meeting basic uh, city necessities. We weren't taking care of our parks. We were not taking care of our streets. But now we're doing it in a greater capacity. And Denver is asking for it in a greater capacity. And so I think it's important that we did staff up. Now, if you want to get very technical and start looking through each of the departments and are certain departments overstaff? I'm sure that that's a great analysis, but I think overall, if we, as we look at this as a macro solution, we are serving our city in a much better way than we were in 2011. Last thought? So, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's where our money is going in, instead of going to the problems. When we're talking about a housing crisis, was there a housing crisis in 2011? Yes. And how bad has it gotten since then? So. And how many departments have been added and how many, how much of a, our budget has been devoted to that? He said a billion dollars of our budget is going to staff. $15 million was uh, our housing fund for homelessness. How do those things compare? They, they don't. We had an entire office created for housing and nothing came out of it. Can I respond now? Sure. I, didn't, I didn't know what time you wanted me to jump in. Okay, so um, we, our, our budget for housing now is $300 million that the mayor uh, has- Over how has long? Since, the mayor has then just uh, partnered with us for $300 million for our, our housing budget. But here's what folks don't understand and I just wanna, you can think up and bring any idea you want to. You got to have six other city council individuals to vote in favor of it. For a housing fund that we need, that's not even enough at $150 million. Over 10 we years. We only got nine votes. 
on council. And that is how tough it is to get things done. I wish I have a billion. I'd be supportive of that. But you have to make sure that you have the support of your council members. And then after that, you've got to make sure that you have the support of the administration. Um, we have reached the last five minutes of the debate, which Great. means uh, thank you for participating. Thank you. This has been amazing. We're going to go ahead and do closing statements for Misha Yu, followed by myself. We'll start with Mr. Brooks. I opened. So you've heard here today um, a lot of inconsistencies in what we're being told is happening at the city level and what we're feeling on the ground. Um, I think that is why we've had so many people running for multiple seats across the city, including myself. The inconsistencies are unacceptable and our, the way we spend our money is a reflection of our values. And what we're witnessing right now in Denver is that we value profit over our people. And in order for Denver to shift, Denver needs to elect new people. In our district, the majority of our district is demanding a new city council representative. And I am here to be that representative. Um, I have a proven track record of my investment in community. Uh, I've always led with solutions and built broad coalitions to get things done without the title, without the pay. I will continue to work for our community and I would love to have the opportunity and platform to do it on a larger scale to serve the most vulnerable in our city, in our district. Please vote for me by June 4th, Candy Sedebaca. Thank you all for uh, tuning in. I want to thank our moderator um, for the really important questions and thank you all for, for just being here. I think this is an important time in our city and I think there's a clear choice um, in front of you today. A clear choice to be the next city council person for District 9. Um, a person uh, who proposes and implements solutions and one who opposes. Um, and, and, and one quick example of what that looks like is a GO bond. Our general obligation bond is for most cities a given. It's the thing that they want to do, uh, use debt to take care of community issues, fix their parks, fix their roads, fix their bridges. 70 plus percent of you supported that GO bond. The projects came from the community. One particular project that I'm thinking about is a pedestrian bridge that connects Elyria to Swansea. Now, we need a pedestrian bridge there because the Elyria students can't get to school on time because there's a train there. The principal advocated for it, mothers advocated for it. We got it on, we got it passed. One person opposed it and it was Candy Cedabaka. That's not the leadership we need. The leadership we need listens to community, even when community disagrees and they disagree, to come together, come up with solution and provide opportunities. My name is Albus Brooks. I'm running for City Council District 9. I want your vote. The other two opponents in this race have endorsed me for their support as well because they believe in inclusive Denver. Dave Valesky and Jonathan Woodley. I want to have your vote on uh, June 4th. Thank you. One last time, I'd like to thank you for participating. Councilman Brooks, thank you for being here. Candy C. Thank, thank you for being here. We would like to thank our host, Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, Civic Matters, and Yellow Scene Magazine. My name is De La Vaca, and the only thing I want you to remember is to go out and vote. You have until June 4th. Uh, you vote. get the democracy that you vote for or don't vote for. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.